Hello everyone, today we talk about Eastern Roman history between the 5th and the 6th century. Um, so this is going to be really a very introductory video if you're well already into um, Byzantine history at this phase especially, I don't think um, I will add anything um, surprising <laughs> to you. Um, say this is just intended for everyone uh, in, in, in different measures and I try to to make it uh, relatively simple, also because these two centuries are uh, really dense of of events, and we will mostly focus essentially on how the uh, Eastern Roman Empire um, at the end of this period actually Roman Empire proper, because the Western half uh, didn't exist anymore, um, managed to survive. Indeed, I mean a bit of a comparison. Uh, with uh, with the Western uh, half, there was just an administrative repartition. Always remember this: there were never, uh, there was never such a thing like two Roman empires, historically speaking. Um, I know de facto there were two different empires, but it still cooperated uh, at a point that, in spite of the enmity that kind of mm, obviously existed at some point. Um, made it theoretically possible for the two halves to be reunited and if you consider what happened in the 6th century uh, a, a part of the West was effectively re-englobed, uh, uh, let's say, uh, reintegrated into uh, into the, the the Roman domains proper, given that the, the West had fallen um, some generation before. So. Um, this is naturally very complicated and very shaded to explain, and today we will not go in depth to that. I realize we should start making a series dedicated exclusively to Byzantine history at this point, because uh, I feel <coughs> these introductory videos are going to be a bit too superficial by, by certain standards, so we have to get a bit more in detail to that. I know there's plenty of people who like Byzantine history out there. Um, so we'll see w what we can do about it. Um, I'll, I'll just think about it. So for now, for today, we start from essentially the death of Theodosius I, 395. Um, this date is very important because um, um, the uh, in a few years before, b between essentially 392 up, up to Theodosius' death, uh, the imperial unity that is essentially the control of a single emperor over the uh, of bo on both halves of the empire um, had been uh, re-established. You know that the empire was um, <coughs> practically split from an administrative point of view, I from a f in a formal way, only from um, from the time of Diocletian. You know, there was this idea with the tetrarchy that the empire was actually split in four, although uh, these were mostly two pairs of, um, let's say, uh, two forts um, kind of sticking together, also here um, uh, tracing the repartition between East and West, um, and this had been mm, done for a series of reasons that also here are difficult to uh, re, um, re repeat. Um, I've done a video about um, Diocletian and the and the tetrarchy that wasn't that bad. So if you wanna, if you look into my Byzantine history playlist, you're gonna find it um, pretty easily. It's uh, it's something like Diocletian's government, something like that. That I mean the title. Um, and the the reasons had been, however, probably the general contraction of the economy, also of the presence of these populations in. Um, Aside the say the borders even of the Roman Empire, even it there was nothing like a border as we imagine them today. I mean, it was a series of um, it, even the same Romans conceived mostly their empire as a series of uh, you know as a uh, as a dominion over peoples, not really over lands. Even though naturally there was a there was a, a material border sometimes, but it wasn't really the standard. Mm -hmm. And especially towards the late empire, the system had really fluidified at the point that the main point was to rule, actually op uh, to concentrate the uh, the Roman control over, actually w the within the empire, so that this naturally required more resources that had to be invested more locally. It was not ch like in the early empire where 
more or less, uh, there was a florid economy. Uh, the Romans had just conquered the Mediterranean. and they were the richest empires that ever been seen in, in the West, and the uh, outer populations were kind of, um, you know, easily controllable. Uh, now, the problem was really administrating from the core and ensuring especially the core would be safe and untouched, especially by the, uh, by the, inva the, en the enemy invasions. So, um, the also Theodosius had, Theodosius is this major figure in late Roman history, also in here it's not today's uh, task to, to talk about him specifically. Um, I made a video about Theodosius and the choice of the East, this is the title, this is also in the Byzantine history playlist, it kind of deals um, a bit with the, eventually, especially what, what happened post Theodosian times, but because of the choice of Theodosius that, in fact, uh, this death had um, established um, that he, uh, the empire had would be split essentially into two uh, halves once again between his two uh, sons. And so basically from 395 um, until the end of the West um, that you can put to mm, uh, depending on 476 uh, with the, p the position of Romulus Augustus or uh, 486 with the fall of the um, kingdom of Siagris or by uh, at 493 at the death of Nepos um, however had, had vanished. So at that point you can argue from a strictly geographical point of view that the Roman Empire was never re, um, re, uh, reunited. Mm -hmm. And this was actually the, the Roman perspective because the Romans even when they lost essentially the these western provinces they always thought by by law, by right, that those lands belonged to the empire, and they never, g never gave up the idea. I mean, historically, um, Constantinople would have never m made it to, um, to to reconquer certain lands. <laughs> I don't know. Think about Britain, or uh, but those were f believed, were conceived in the Roman perspective as um, the lege, uh, part of the empire. Mm -hmm. And and the basically the the the, the, the first objective of the um, uh, Roman Empire was in in foreign politics at least theoretically to reconquer all of these lands, mm -hmm. and uh, and you see that the, the Byzantine Empire throughout all its history kind of mm, yeah there was a moment of contraction then eventually re expansion and the aim was however always to to expand obviously in territories that were profitable for for themselves as, as well um, and that turned out to be essentially the same territories I mean the Byzantines never expanded into places where the, the Roman rule had had not existed also because the Roman Empire at, at the peak of its um, geographical extension was always uh, essentially a uh, uh, something huge and uh, and and the Byzantines that were always the same Romans tried always to re I mean to re-follow the the path of their um, uh, predecessors, because obviously there were m major strategical reasons that r remained unaltered throughout the centuries. I mean it's obvious that you want to reconquer places like Egypt or Meso Mesopotamia, or that you want to expand into Italy, or because those are lands that have a kind of a, in spite of the changes, the transformations, they still have that. Uh, important value. The Byzantine Empire always had this mostly Mediterranean uh, vocation, mm -hmm. even when they kind of settled more, even in uh, uh, on a land base and by certain standards. Especially um, Asia Minor and the Balkans were the uh, the, uh, the cornerstone of the Byzantine domination, um, and it was a big deal of emphasis of so terrestrial expansion as it would be normal, but also in here the, the idea is that the Mediterranean and its coasts were throughout the whole mm, Middle Ages the most prof profitable areas to control. Mm. The richest, the wealthiest, the most populated, um, um, the one also with a um, greater per capita wealth, that, I that is very important because one thing is controlling 
a land that has um, I don't know a certain feudal organization for which there is always going to be an aristocracy that is going to oppose you and that necessarily you you need to control the territory but essentially entrusting power to it uh, along, along the Mediterranean were the still these communities that around the Mediterranean were still these communities that kind of resembled the ancient Roman model I mean the 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 cornerstone of the city of trade of the middle classes um, and and style forms mm, that uh, were also in here uh, partly of Roman legacy but also were kind of being developed once again during the Middle Ages um, especially in the independent city states uh, etc um, so this was essentially the moment at the end of the fourth century where this unity was broken kind of forever and this naturally brought th there were many reasons for this um, once again the video I made on Theodosius wha is pretty explicative I believe um, but it was um, it was a, um, a marked preference for the eastern co uh, provinces and this had been the trend since the time of Constantine and I know it's plenty of people out there who still believe oh you know those were not true Romans anymore and uh, there was such a poor choice you know Rome could uh, and had to remain the capital uh, etc but this is not really true there was nothing actually ideological in, into this shift on the country was a very pragmatic decision that eventually naturally the the Byzantines meant as the Eastern Romans kind of capitalized upon also from a kind of an ideological point of view mm. even for religious reasons for instance Constantinople had practically at the beginning no no religious importance whatsoever for instance for Christianity so uh, if you take if you took Rome or Alexandria or Jerusalem obviously um, or Antioch and uh, look at these cities and say okay well these were actually the true centers of Christianity Constantinople kind of arrived later and it was always this um, kind of complex and uh, and um, but however this is not maybe so important now but just for saying that um, originally speaking there was nothing really I, it was pure Roman pragmatism in shifting the capital to Constantinople and by the way it wasn't even the capital proper because Rome actually remained the capital of the Roman Empire even when Constantinople was shifted, I mean, mm, uh, w when Constantinople was became the center uh, of the empire, and this was simply because there were at the time already several capitals. There were different to take Trier or Milan or uh, Nice um, uh, or uh, uh, Nicomedia, etc. Um, and it was normal to um, it had become already natural to shift the administration and especially the control of um, the military administration on these uh, cities that had a greater strategical importance and Constantinople definitely grew to the size and importance it had because of its uh, extraordinary geographical location um, so the, <laughs> the you, you can already see that by it's from the third century that such differences um, had began to 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 grow mm, between the uh, the West and the East, mm, especially uh, at a socio-economical level, because the uh, the East um, was characterized, arguably, since the classical times, actually, um, by a greater vitality especially for in trade and uh, and crafts and I, I mean um, and uh, and especially uh, around these large cities this l large metropolis that is obviously also in the West there were large metropolis uh, there wasn't just Rome but the um, the Western provinces had been mostly I mean, if you take out Italy and part of the south, uh, and especially, and not just only Italy, I mean, Italy meant in a narrow sense, that is, um, central and southern Italy and Sicily, and s certain parts of southern France and so certain parts of southern Spain, 
the Western provinces, so talking about Cisalpine Gaul, Spain, um, Gaul, and Britain, were actually had not seen that dynamism. Y yeah, of course, the Romans had definitely uh, intensely Romanized these areas that they, they had exported full urbanisms, um, the uh, the famed Roman highways. Um, of course, the Celts already had certain road systems, but uh, let's be honest about it, it wasn't at all li like some people would like to believe what eventually the Romans built in there, how they broke aqueducts, I mean they broke what we can call uh, with a bit of arrogance civilization and obviously this passed through also the slaughtering of millions uh, in the process but um, the uh, the idea is yeah the Romans kind of made it to transform and this is gonna be most evident in during the Middle Ages Western Europe into something different from, for instance, Central Europe or Eastern Europe. And, uh, however, there weren't the same preconditions of the Mediterranean that had that new, you know, urbanism and a more advanced civilization since, you know, even mil millennia uh, before Christ. Even the same Romans objectively emerged from an Italic background that was pretty much rough and tribal and, and, and warlike, not really uh, the same thing that exists, uh, had existed for instance in Greece for already from, from, from some time. Um, so the East kind of lived on. You can argue that the Roman Empire, uh, I mean during the Roman dom domination as the kind of the leading um, center. You know, after all the Romans, if you so especially their territorial expansion, you notice that they first of all seized this Mediterranean uh, area, this coastal area, and then only afterwards began to expand into into inland, into continental Europe proper. Um, so mm, it was obvious at all times that the eastern uh, part of the empire was the most um, developed, the most vital, the most dynamic, economically speaking, the, the, the also the, the, the most educated. You can argue as I was saying before, the Roman Empire is fully an Hellenistic Empire by at least the second century AD. I mean it's but even before, I mean the same the same Romans were strongly um Hellenized by, by certain standards and they were able to even though they produced actually an, an, an or a very original synthesis because if the Romans had followed for instance the, the Hellenic political models they would have never had an empire from and that's the reasons why the, the Romans, uh, in well, a very approximate reason for which the Romans managed to conquer the the, the Hellenic the, or better Hellenistic world at that point. Um, so, and just think also the Roman domination was harsh in the measure it naturally controlled everything. It was a, um, but it, it was much more decentralized and, and lighter um, than than we imagine today. Um, uh, simply and not because the Romans were, you know, such pious souls, and <laughs> um, uh, after all, but um, they—it's uh, simply because at the time there was no other way to control territories. We're not in industrial times when you have centralized sta nation states with permanent, um, you know, with firearms and uh, and this massive deterrent factor that is able to to keep mm, tens of millions under your rule just uh, at the point of the bayonet. In, in ancient times this could not be done. There were very different um, relations. Um, the Romans had basically made it to, uh, to create the empire by co-opting and um, Romanizing the, uh, the, the elites of, the, uh, of, the, of uh, Europe and, and the Mediterranean. Uh, and that's why the Roman Empire was such an effective thing for such a long time. So people get so obsessed, but uh, why did the Roman Empire f uh, fall? I mean, first of all, it didn't really fall, <laughs> at least until the 15th century. Um, and secondly, uh, if you're just talking about the Western half, you should most likely ask uh, rather how it did it even manage to last so long in the first place, and you realize that the Romans had got it right in s at so many levels, and differently from from other empires out there and it what really makes the Roman Empire unique um, in itself but this is not really the point um, and 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 actually the 
the real cornerstone of, of the ancient world in this sense had been the um, middle and small landed um, property that in the east had been more present mm -hmm. um, um, than, than in the west. This is kind of paradoxical because um, the west had had this mm, kind of more egalitarian background given what was the the, uh, the original society of these populations, like the Gauls, the the Italics, the, the um, etc. And in, in the East, citizens were used to uh, actually, I mean, citizens. They were. This is the main difference. They they were mostly subjects already. You know, that even the Romans dealt with the with the inhabitants of the Roman Empire in very different ways. You know, in the West, this egalitarian ethos and the concept of citizen, etc., was much more deeply felt than in the East, where uh, you can see it, f for instance, from the Augustan propaganda, you know, that Augustus in Rome was just essentially a primus in Tarparis, a, a princap, in fact, um, um, a princap, sorry, um, and simply a Roman citizen, if you want, with some extra prerogative, but essentially that. When you find uh, Augustan pr mm, propaganda in, into Egypt, you realize that Augustus was presenting himself essentially uh, as a god, as a, as a divinity, or at least as a... And this is obviously very shaded as well. We should maybe go a bit deeper into, into that topic uh, in the future. But just for saying, paradoxically, the Eastern subjects were already, you know, take the pharaohs or the Persian kings uh, of, of kings uh, and all these empires that Alex Alexander, etc. They had, they were more used to the concept of being subjects and by certain standards they were also more easy, uh, they were actually easier to rule. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time the Hellenistic civilization had managed to maintain a decent amount of um, you know, free men of, of um, small and medium property owners that kind of they were the the uh, the sap of um, um, of Eastern uh, economy in many ways. Also, because there was a lot of trade involved into those regions, so there was necessarily um, you know certain dynamics were very difficult to control. And plus, there were so many people out there. Think about how many people lived in places like the the Nile uh, Valley or the um, the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, valleys, um, and all around the Mediterranean. So um, even in there, especially all these um, Hellenic city states that existed that had been based, uh, that there were oligarchic systems uh, at the time, especially during the Hellenistic t uh, age. But they were, however, still based on this concept of being citizens first of all. So there was it wasn't this implied a sort of middle class that still worked in spite of the increasing stru social stratification and and the east managed to, to keep this balance more than in the west where essentially the tribesmen were turned into citizens but eventually were kind of turned into colonists and and, and therefore in sort of serfs but also towards the very end um, I mean not serfs by right but de facto indeed if you look at how because the the roman latifundium uh, had expanded so much um the western aristocracy also the romans had managed to to to, cr to make a bit more of a of social engineering in the west in this sense more directly at least um so it, it ended up paradoxically at the end of this period to see a western uh, uh roman uh, aristocracy that was kind of taking over everything in the West and in the East instead um, there were definitely aristocracies but uh, you can argue that the same Byzantine state was built o around a bureaucracy of, uh, of, of com drawn from the middle class also there was much more social mobility and this was also by the way one of the reasons that increased the di differences even the cultural identities and, and, and perspectives of the between uh, the West and the East, because in the West, actually, the Roman senatorial class thought to be the real heir of the Roman tradition, and it, that was actually true, because these were the, the people who actually spoke Latin, who were more 
uh, educated we even when um, they uh, they got Christianized they kind of still were extremely proud of, about their uh, pagan uh, legacy uh, the Eastern provinces had been Christianized much earlier much more intensively and um, and the rebuilding of the empire in the east was seen as a sort of um, was seen uh, in the west as a sort of um, uh, an accomplishment of newcomers hmm, by certain standards and they uh, the uh, definitely in the west they they were but however the west collapsed and the west survived so this also probably should make us reflect relatively to this we whenever I I hinted at this topics many times actually <laughs> in my in my videos I not I never got thoroughly into into it actually well okay it's better if I don't say <laughs> because I always don't want to to say you know I have sympathy for someone in here involved but um, sometimes there is this kind of teleological um, perspective like saying okay well in the east uh, they kind of were clever than in the West, mm. uh, from a strictly Roman perspective, like, um, and it is true. By by, I mean, in the East also, they, they were more capable of exploiting the the the, the situation during this time, and uh, that's the reason why the East lived on and the West didn't. But at the same time, what happened in the West is probably also more. It's it's m definitely more sad, but it's, it's sometimes it's interpreted okay. So the West was just a dark hole after, especially w the the fall of, of the Western half of the Roman Empire, and it was so bad. You know, the Byzantines were so bad. But uh, actually, what happened in the West was also very interesting, very important, definitely overlooked also in terms of civilization and what, uh, especially the integration between the Germans and the Romans that was kind of adverted in, in the East where at a certain point at the beginning of the 5th century was an extremely violent reaction for instance against the Germans um, this naturally saved in part the Eastern Roman Empire but at the same time you can argue that it, it kind of um, in, uh, conferred to this eastern half a character of greater um, I mean it, it brought the seeds of this crystallized system that uh, especially in later times during the Middle Ages would start to to be a very um, um, you know a, a negative factor for the Empire mm -hmm. and they definitely the the empire was functional, actually, to the uh, very, um, to the very, um, at least until the 12th century. You know, the empire was w was always something. The, the, the moment of glory were were between the the the, the, the sixth century, um, the um, the eleventh century, twelfth century. I mean, the, the times in which the empire managed. Also, in previous times, it was a greater, a great. Um, a devil. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. But what is uh, normally criticized about um, what is usually mm, observed to have been the case of the Byzantines is that they they kind of remained stuck to their own traditionalism and were not able eventually in in late much later times to um, to evolve from that you know and to adapt. And adaptation was in here, especially in this century, is the key um, for for the survival of the same eastern half, mm. in spite of these characters of of um, o of great um, um, r um, intransigence that were starting to take place. But however. This is maybe <laughs> confusing now for f mm, for you, but um, because you're probably wondering wh what the hell is he talking about now, and <laughs> just stick to the topic. Okay, let's go on. You're right. Um, the um, so naturally, as we have said before, and I never made a video specifically about it, but I, I gave it for granted uh, after 476 A.D. 
there was nothing. Mm. Yeah, even the people who actually lived in, in that specific year probably didn't absolutely realize that anything had changed. Mm. Yeah. There was just this re um, restitution uh, of the uh, um, uh, red deliver, if you want, uh, of the Imperial insignia from from Odoacre to the Eastern Emperor. So this w was recognized that basically, not that the empire there didn't exist anymore, because this was, by the way, a um, an implicit recognition of sovereignty of Constantinople at that point. It was really um, a, a measure to to get rid of this problem of the. Um, election of the emperors that in in late in very late um, years of the of the Western Empire uh, had been such a problem because of political intrigue and some section although was quite pragmatic it said okay let's um, let's kind of get rid of this and um, in, in exchange uh, let's um, send the uh, imperial insignia back to Constantinople so that we, we I show to be kind of a nice guy that maybe is gonna also get um, legitimized to, to, to ruling here. Then ev eventually things got wrong for him <laughs> because the Byzantines uh, s sent the Ostrogoths uh, in there and, and he w and Odoacre was killed but uh, um, that was also due indeed to the presence of the Ostrogoths that the, the Byzantines wanted to get rid of and we'll see uh, you know, uh, they were they were actually successful in doing this, um, but uh, the point I was making is that the um, political legacy of Rome, and not just that, the, the political one, um, was kept being witnessed, especially in the conception of the state mm -hmm. in the Eastern half, or better now, in in Constantinople, I mean, in the Roman Empire, that at <coughs> that point wa was not Eastern Empire anymore, it was just simply Roman Empire, given the West didn't exist anymore, so it hadn't, didn't make any sense to say, okay, we call, keep calling us Eastern Roman Empire. People say, oh, well, uh, you know, we, we let's not use the term Byzantine, let's say uh, Eastern Roman Empire, well, that's wrong as well, because um, until, you know, you can use it until there was a Western Roman Empire, but uh, after 476, um, AD, you should keep saying plainly Roman Empire. So if at that point you have to say Eastern Roman Empire, it's better if you say Byzantine because it kind of uh, <laughs> it's shorter. So for the sake of grammar, uh, as long as we understand obviously uh, what we're talking about, you can be even more specific by using Byzantine in in a completely neutral and non-derogatory derogatory term. So I'm fine with that. I'm not a purist who has to say I, I usually say Roman Empire, but I realize that when people I mean still today uh, we, we talk about Roman Empire, Roman Empire, the first thing is saying, okay, I think of the Roman Empire of, uh, of Augustus of, uh, of Trajan and, and so on. Then uh, if you start saying in the Roman Empire and, and you want to be more specific relatively to what we call the Byzantine side, you also we're talking about a millinery history here. Um, it's kind of fine to, to use the term Byzantine to me. I mean, I'm sure in the future we will kind of mm, go past that um, as well. But as long as you use the term Byzantine by knowing that it's actually an approximation, it's something that was created later and was never known at the time, and <laughs> it's actually also partly a negative term, but yeah, okay you can still use it as long as probably in fact I must say that today we, we use the term Byzantine as even as a positive not just an, as a neutral term but also as a positive thing you know if I think everybody will, will hears the term Byzantine thinks about this beautiful uh, Eastern art uh, with all these light with these colors this gold uh, just that the first picture comes into my mind so I don't have any for instance I don't have any uh, Sub negative um, subjective perception of the term Byzantine at this point. However, it's still important to stress that this was the Roman Empire point. Mm -hmm. And up to 1453 or even the fall of, um, of Trebizond or uh, Epirus into 
and to the end of the Ottomans we talk about the Roman Empire point so um, naturally Byzantine is uh, a term <laughs> coming from uh, the, uh, the city of Byzantium mm -hmm. uh, there was this uh, Greek uh, city, Greek colony, actually a very old one, it was founded uh, I think in the 5th, in the 6th century BC probably, even earlier, and this by the way were you know it's not that the Greeks went building where nothing existed before, this was a uh, previously Thracian settlement and eventually during ancient times it didn't have such a huge importance then it's however it was this um, kind of good location, extremely good location so Constantine thought well to do rebuild a city from scratch in there and to make it and it was an excellent choice given that this m remained basically the capital of the empire for f forever and so many people tried to uh, to conquer they they didn't make it uh, still or at least yeah at a certain point they made it in 1204 but even in there was more uh, the internal situation of the same uh, Byzantine world to be a bit troubled but however it took eventually the uh, the artillery uh, of Mohammed the, the second to, to take down even the Theodosian walls it is something impressive if you think about it that something was built and uh, into into ancient times it was still withstood as a military infrastructure for the whole Middle Ages practically. So th that's where the that's why the Romans got things right <laughs> because they knew how to make uh, them them last for long. Um, so there is also a much debate, you know, where where this Byzantine era kind of starts you know what is that uh, this um, Greek citadel on the shores of uh, uh, I mean on the Bosphorus w was really that how could it change radically the point of saying okay we're talking about Byzantines now not Romans or, or, or why that is would it make sense to, to conceive it in the first place I would add well, <laughs> it's complicated to explain, and there's also a lot of debate because um, many people get it kind of in a nationalistic way, or they tend to stress certain characters of the Byzantine culture um, at the detriment of others, or, or vice versa, by the way, because it's really from both sides. There are people who are totally in love with uh, uh, with Constantinople, there are people who kind of want to um despise it um it, it, it's today i think that there is a great even if you go in, in on on the internet and social net networks you realize that byzantine history however is getting so much interest mm. this partly happened also because of certain historiographical re reconsiderations because also um the uh, anglo uh, speaking uh or better angle of writing historiography is um, being very uh, interested in the topic so there was a kind of a fallout in popular culture in the anglosphere the attention towards um, Constantinople and the, uh, the the recognition of this absence as, as it said um, you know when we're talking about Byzantine history because indeed a, f a huge amount of stuff is being written especially on late antique on the late antique world this is also pretty disturbing because I think um, there is there are fashions sometimes you know I personally like much more Byzantine history f I, I mean I, I love late antique uh, history personally but um, so much is being written about it and and, and so few is being written about uh, the uh, or relatively few however fewer about uh, the medieval Roman Empire, the medieval proper, you know, if I I like very much the, the Macedonian, the Comnenian uh, dynasties, um, uh, and those, by the way, are also the, the most famous, but I mean, the story of the Eastern Roman Empire, I'll say use here, of the Roman Empire during the Middle Ages is so very important. 
also, and not just for itself, because you don't have to take this world as a sort of a monad that, yeah, they thought of themselves to be on their own, as a sort of, uh, especially in medieval times, in this kind of um, sacred order that withstood chaos outside, and partly it was also good, <laughs> kind of good interpretation, but at the same time there are so many um, influences that the Empire had on many other populations, even in the strategical balance and all. Uh, much more should be written about the Middle Ages in the first place, let's, let's be honest. Um, this is not just about uh, the Byzantine Empire. And, 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 and I'm very disappointed because I think that this incredible interest in late antique history is actually very ideological today I mean this is a that's a beautiful time in, in history that's um, extremely fascinating and we also naturally have to be thankful for to people who write about it uh, for you know letting us know it in, in, in such a deep way but at the same time sometimes you, you, you see that there is a very sectorial interest and the reasons are also, um, um, I, I mean, the interest towards this period is also very ideological, especially uh, if you take, you know, these problems of uh, immigration and all, and this kind of, mm, the problem of the multi-ethnical world and all. Uh, this is the reason why we, in our years, are so obsessed by the late antique. Mm -hmm. While, and we're kind of falling on the, you know, uh, as if we were characterizing too much the specific period in history on the base on our own experience, while these problems, especially concerning immigration or, you know, multi-ethnicity and the problems of integration and coexistence, etc., are things that you basically find all over history. So characterizing the late antique as this major moment of problem of, of you know, of uh, identities, of conf of conflict because of that it's kind of yeah I mean I real I understand why this happens because this there is even this evident reason uh, these evident consequences too but um, sometimes the interests in themselves are probably a bit ideologically driven and and I don't want to criticize the academy specifically although I know that there is this kind of ideologism in there in part as well whereas other scholars are extremely objective and intelligent and and refined in their way of looking at history. It's, it's rather what pop culture wants to see of it that is disturbing sometimes. Um, and on both sides, I'm, I'm, as always in my videos, I'm not making it a point of my individual subjective perception of the thing. Um, I mean, uh, my personal sympathy, my personally, personal beliefs, I think there is um, an increasing mm, polarization in ideologism. So either you fit in one group or you fit in the other. And uh, I must say, the more you study history, the more you realize that uh, the truth lays in the, in the very middle of it. And uh, th in this sense, it's very difficult and probably also meaningless to categorize in such ways. And it's I think, as always with history, it's already an enormous thing if you are able to understand it in the first place you know it's like uh, what we were saying before about the term Byzantine people <laughs> I know people v that would ki would kill each other <laughs> just for settling this thing of you know is um, should we use the term Byzantine or not and wh what are the meanings attached to it but my point is who the hell cares just study that history and do not worry about which term you have to use, as long as you know things, because that's what makes the difference eventually. Um, and although I also take side in that part, but in a in a rather um, unusual way from from what I've seen, um, maybe one day we'll talk to you about it. We'll make this <laughs> kind of confession video about my thoughts about uh, <laughs> these topics, but I don't know just if you're interested, which you're not, probably, I guess. Um, no, actually, it could be interesting in general, just to, to also to, to hear from you what you think, because, you know, uh, I conceive a Schwerpunkt as a sort of dialogue with you, so 
it's not just me talking although it's just me talking but you can comment you can respond that's gonna be cool actually um, so mm, so I guess everybody knows the story um, the West um, increasingly suffered of the pressure and eventually of the invasions of the so-called Germanic populations today we prefer to use the term barbarian once again because in the 70s just to tell you how history works uh, in the 70s uh, the, the the term barbarian was thought to be too offensive or some kind uh, they, they began to say well these were germanic populations and the truth is that they weren't first of all today we are criticizing even the same concept of germanic because we think increasingly that it was a kind of uh, ethnographical invention of the Mediterranean world and that these populations didn't actually conceive of themselves as Germanic if not when they entered in contact with the Romans so that they kind of absorbed the same Roman models concerning themselves mm, their vision of themselves um, I tried I also like to challenge a bit this idea because I I think it's a bit overly stressed I mean I, I truly believe it was some kind of Germanic identity that was surely very blurred and very um, debatable but even if it was not calling that way it was not perceiving that way it, there was some uh, there were some characteristics at least that were common to certain Germanic populations but it is indeed true that there was plenty of populations were not fully Germanic mm. um, for certain peoples we talk about uh, Slavic Germanic or Sarmatian Germanic um, for not talking about these Turkic peoples like uh, I don't know the Huns or about which also in there we, we ca tend to categorize a bit too much because basically the the Eurasian steps were, were such a messed up melting pot that doesn't even make so much sense to say okay these were Indo-European or they were uh, Turkic because they could be from a tribal point of view in terms of strictly tribal identity but we're all blended in to be honest mm. so don't be surprised if there is a Han who looks blonde and uh, with blue eyes because it would have been perfectly possible for even for a an allegedly Turkic people mm. we see it even for the Turks uh, I don't know during the Middle Ages you know they, they were extremely mixed um, so today instead we come back with we, we kind of reevaluate the term barbarian because yeah it's very um, Heleno and Romano centric in many ways but at the same time it's 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 really making all these peoples fit into the wall so there is no kind of discrimination there is no kind of leaning towards one ethnicity or the other these were definitely prevalently Germanic populations, as we were saying, but there were also many other elements. And barbarian is used in this sense as a... Uh, it depends, because by the way, the Greeks and the Romans used the term barbarian in different ways. Mm. Actually, the Romans uh, took the term mm, barbaros from the, Greek, uh, from the Greeks, but they use it in a very different way because the Romans were way more open than the Greeks to other peoples they weren't so you know um, uh, self um, you know they, 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 were, they weren't so snob so posh to um, to to conceive themselves as and, and and they actually had based there differently from the Greeks the mm, mm, the the success of their empire on integration of these barbarians that were Romanized and this was the greatest glory of the Romans if, if you look at the propaganda of uh, this time of the emperors even after Adrianople uh, so when actually the Romans had got defeated by the gods but eventually the gods ended up to enter into the Roman Empire as subjects de facto the greatest thing was saying okay look at these you know fierce barbarians that were transformed by our ma mighty emperor into um, uh, into uh, peasants, into workers, into colonists. They were civilized. Mm -hmm. So the barbarian was kind of the good savage stereotype. I mean, it was conceived like that. Um, and uh, it wasn't fully negative. Actually, also, the Romans were extremely keen uh, 
on ethnography, especially in this um, later time. The Romans had been mostly interested in, in ethnography during the phase of expansion of their empire. So towards, um, you know, as long as the, the empire was stable, uh, there were no new populations out there that kind of ethnography in, kind of fell a bit in 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 uh, it was not less fashionable anymore towards the late the late empire ethnography kicks prepotently in once again so there was also a lot of interest towards these populations and thankfully uh, to the Roman thanks to the Romans because uh, otherwise we would have not known anything about these peoples um, as unfortunately it's the case however also uh, through Roman historiography we don't know this huge much but um, however the uh, the West was increasingly under the pressure of these populations and these populations were as as it's al also widely known today, didn't really have anything against the Romans proper. Surely they thought to be um, very different from them. And we're talking now specifically about the Germanic populations, not the Turkic ones, because uh, uh, the actually the the nomads of the steppes, I mean the ones who really lived, they they were completely incompatible with Roman society. The Germans instead had undergone for sheer um, osmosis, let's say, uh, a very intense process of Romanization throughout all the first centuries after Christ. Um, so, yeah, we shouldn't maybe stress this so much because, after all, they, you know, they were still pretty in with their own mindset. But they kind of knew the empire. They they knew what it was about. They they partially they had integrated. Um, can see it easily on the R Rhine frontier. There were many cities that were founded among these Germanic populations that kind of integrated um, um, quite easily. They got Romanized, they got citizens, etc. And you can see it o also because of the service, military service that they, you, you know, uh, they performed into the Roman army. We discussed about this in that video about the Merovingian, uh, about Clovis. Um, that was incidentally son of one of these um, Germanic chieftains that had fought into the Roman army for Rome and against the enemies of Rome. Um, so actually the Germans liked the empire and they wanted to enjoy its benefits. So, mm, and by the way, when they got under the pressure, especially people's populations of the steppes like the Huns, etc., they reversed en masse into the empire. And this was naturally the empire at this point, it was uh, exhausted, they didn't, or at least it didn't have enough, it was not still exhausted. But talking about the West, um, it, 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 had, it didn't have enough manpower to counter these invasions. So as it had been actually normal, even though in 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 lesser uh, size, let's say in overall, uh, for centuries the Romans began to necessarily let these people in. And the main problem is that basically they couldn't be controlled as long as they were a unique block of populations. It was in, these weren't just small bands were, you know, integrated and scattered and the perfectly Romanized um, since the time of uh, of Caesar and Augustus, etc., these were entire p peoples that dwelt as single political entities, which is also an approximation within the same Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So, telling the truth, these populations had a very low degree of centralization. They, they were all kind of clans sticking together in, in confederations, etc. But they still understood that moving as one. Um, was profitable enough even in that con context of within the Roman and this uh, empire. This is the hard lesson the the Germans had learned during the period, you know, from from the beginning of the mi migration era. If you don't stick together, you don't survive out there in in, in the wild. So um, they had learned how to kind of have, but otherwise their edus was much more. Uh, egalitarian in, in many ways and then it was very was kind of antithetic with Germanic culture the idea of having a king who governed over, over subjects they, they didn't feel it like that and partly 
this began to occur also in the Romano-Germanic kingdoms exactly because of the Roman models that were taken from the uh, I mean by the um, the um, the Germanic elites from um, the the empire itself and that kind of also radically transformed these societies that in fact we call as Latin Germanic societies, not Germanic societies anymore. Um, naturally we could do exceptions as naturally there were many Germans who remained in Germany for instance and kept living the way they did but also in there um, they were very different um, say in the 6th century from the, uh, I don't know, the 1st century Alpha a millennium into which they had basically integrated, uh, excuse me, interacted with uh, with the Romans, didn't go un unnoticed and uh, wi without consequences. Sorry. Um, so <laughs> the so the West had all this peculiar history that if you look at it it's not like the Germans arrived and the, um, they crushed the Western Empire they simply settled into places by the way w to which the same Romans even didn't live anymore um, because of all the crises the, f the, f you know, the, the wars, the devastations, the, the, the plague, the famines and, and all this stuff so even if you look at certain areas you know, it, it wasn't really bad to settle someone in there, and that's the how the Romans had always dealt with, with the situation. So, um, telling the truth, the Germans living to the west weren't uh, del um, they weren't actually dwelling; they were f they weren't faring pretty well um, as well into into the west. This is something that is often overlooked. They were still pretty uh, much in trouble. Um, that was definitely a um, th th their problem. I it was substantially a matter of manpower because, uh, especially at the beginning, they, you know, the, the the decline of the Latin Germanic kingdoms actually started since the beginning. Uh, in perspective, as long as these Germans had to abandon their their Mm, say tribal mm, mindset and this idea to be the conquerors that had to rule all over the others also because the demographic uh, dynamics were completely against them because there were often a, a few um, you know some some tens of thousand mm, people among population of Roman provinces that were counted into millions instead um, so well, okay. I want now. It, it doesn't. Uh, I'm. I i should be talking about the Eastern Empire, but this was important to to also to give a bit of background for the comparison with the West. Mm. But I've done. If you go into the Migration Era playlist, you can find plenty of videos that deal with these problems. So I will just leave you with that um, um, uh, regard uh, relatively to this uh, topic. Um, the East. The Roman East instead dealt with this in a completely different fashion. Um, objectively, the Eastern Roman Empire had was kind of easier to defend. Uh, it was more gravitating around these choke points of crossing between uh, Europe and Asia. Um, it had a mm, uh, an act, uh, It was much more maritime power than in, than could had really many options where to intervene, how to deal, how where, where to control. It had more resources, also more infrastructures. Mm -hmm. um, the um, also military infrastructure at this point. So, however, chiefly throughout diplomacy, and they were very clever to basically um, divert the this the, the movements of these great um of these populations that were you know um moving all around there and and it's kind of all remarkable because telling the truth Constantinople was in fact in the east so it was actually closer to the um to the major movements of the steps i mean Constantinople you have you have basically the black sea in the north and that's the 
uh, in the north there it's the area of the steppe it's the same place from which all these populations kind of set in motion and um, and in fact actually the major you know problems have begin to start in there with in in trace with uh, with the uh, with the Visigoths that had arrived into uh, we think about the Battle of Adrianople. So actually, a lot of problems had started in the Balkans themselves for the Romans, um, but still the East was a, an enough solid system to withstand and or sometimes to absorb, but, but mostly to divert, especially in later times, these movements. Excuse me, I drink a bit. And this was not an easy process. Mm. And also in here, mm, I, I admit I'm not ex excessively uh, expert about the sheer dynamics of the whole thing. I, I kind of tend to interpret it in a more structural way than. Um, but um, it should be stressed how even the East faced a huge amount of difficulties, mm. both externally and internally. Mm. Uh, but I it's um, they kind of stuck to the mm, with tenaciously to this Roman model mm -hmm. to the idea that um, there was uh, somehow even a divine mission for this. this these are the centuries in which the concept of Romania was being coined even ideologically speaking I mean the land of the Romans is also the land um, of the Christians this time the uh, the Empire was was uh, was Christian fully uh, officially um, the the idea that this was n not an empire like the others not just something that could modify itself but be because of these models the chiefly the Christian and the Roman one it had to remain uh, uh, unchanged, mm. unmodified. So even this criticism of about the, the later um, Byzantine rigidity towards other models and this kind of um, um, in, mm, this kind of uh, closure of closing towards the external was something that has to be understood because it had been a successful model at the beginning. The Eastern Roman Empire had made it to survive uh, contrarily uh, to the West exactly because it had stuck to uh, even with obstination to these <coughs> excuse me, to these models. So um, excuse me but when you know, with the uh, winter winter uh, ends, uh, s there are it gets warmer, and there are uh, even uh, a minimum of um, of pollen in in the air. I I start <laughs> uh, I start sneezing, but uh, you will forgive me. That we'll have we will have a pretty intense uh, spring ahead <laughs> uh, because of this. Um, so this Roman model has to be understood as the true identity um, system of, and this is important because there is a switch in identity. Because w even at, at at the peak of the empire, actually the Romans were extremely obviously proud about their Roman identity. It was let's remember it, it's mostly a political identity. The Romans were not a people. The Romans were a political group. Mm. You could come from literally everywhere and speak uh, every language you wanted to get dressed uh, the way you wanted. As long as you spoke Latin, you served uh, the uh, Roman administration or the military, you could become a citizen, and that was it. Mm. Yeah, th it was not fully. You were not fully free because even religiously speaking, let's debunk this myth that uh, the Roman Empire was a tolerant empire because it definitely was tolerant for the standards, very tolerant. Um, but still, you couldn't really believe everything you wanted, mm. and this 
this was this was valid for several cults that actually also in here the Romans were not dogmatic about it they just said okay it, we have to be pragmatic about this uh, basically the Romans for forbade all these um, all the cults that didn't recognize their imperial rule that's that's if you wonder why they persecuted the Christians that was the reason but they were also against magics I mean these things that it's also very difficult to at a point they persecuted druidism um, but also in there there were very pragmatic reasons for that you know that, that n are not necessarily fully irrational because they still have to deal with those times beliefs and uh, but um, just for saying that the Roman Empire was a uh, very open uh, in 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 many ways although we shouldn't think in it in in our modern ways because that would be a pretty serious historical uh, mistake um, the uh, I don't I don't remember what where I was going with this oh yeah that I mean I wanted to stress the fact that there was this body of citizens in the empire that at the beginning were also the minority compared to the subjects that eventually during the third century they were they became they became de facto the majority especially after the edict of Caracalla with to which as long as you spoke Latin practically in a few other conditions you you were automatically citizens of the empire because the whole thing had been in the previous centuries about whom the Roman citizenship had to be expanded to. And at this point it kind of became pretty homogeneous. So at that point actually up to that point however th there were so many populations in the sense that even living dwelling within the Roman Empire they really didn't feel themselves as, as Romans. You can see that also in the West that there were certain areas that had been under the Roman Empire for for half of a millennium, but that still hadn't substantially Romanized. Um, if you take the north of Spain or uh, today's um, Bretagne um, or some cer certain areas of Britain, I mean, there were places that objectively said, "Okay, we don't care about the Romans." I mean, as long as they didn't create problems, the Romans didn't care about them either. So this is r really how the empire worked. Um, so those identities, and I think especially in the West, were more marked. In the East, at this point, there is this transformation for which becoming a Roman was something much more spiritual, if you want. And, and, and this has, nothing, has not necessarily to do with the Christianization. That obviously pushed much for it, but there is also in the process of transformation from citizens to subjects, and this stratification of society and this new propaganda, this ideology also of feeling the emperor to be uh, now a fully uh, representative of, of the Christian order on earth and all, all this um, ideology that followed that you were not just looking at as it had been in the past at being a Roman as a quite pragmatic thing of, I don't know, getting citizenship and um, um, making things with that also for your future, for your family, for your career. At this point, it was a matter of being a subject and being part of our, this glorious empire, of this Christian empire, of the Christian empire. Not just like an empire like the others. Someone who had come um, just uh, the day before yesterday at conquering your own uh, lands, cattle, and, and women. <laughs> but being part of something that you truly belonged to. As long as you were Christian, you could enter into the empire and it was fine. Mm -hmm. Then of course later we see there is a bit of a problem with the heresies that's living after. So in, in, in at this point the concept of Romania kind of becomes a totalizing factor. So that the Byzantines, uh, if you want to perhaps see what Byzantine is, probably so if you want to stress this approximation because you can't do without the idea that these were still Romans fully if you really have to stress the differentiation just probably I mean my I, I personally see it as this is the real point it's really the um, the, the personal 
approach to the idea of, of romanity, you can say. Um, this took, however, also certain kind of ethnical, I mean, no, this is definitely wrong, but there was a character of um, a religious and, and, and ethnical in some part character. For instance, the very strong anti-Germanic reaction that took place in the year 400 Constantinople, so the slaughtering of uh, um, a lot of German soldiers, because up to that point there were enough Germans in the East, like like just like in the West. Mm -hmm. And these Germans were doing essentially what, what was happening in the West, I mean, um, making career in the army, getting at the head of certain troops and um, even having influence in the political scene and even controlling the imperial um, politics and also at a certain point Constantinople they decided to slaughter all the Germans. It was a very bloody uh, episode um, and that's the way how basically the East got rid of these foreign element that wasn't to be understood however as foreign because as we have seen also the Eastern Roman Empire was extremely multi-ethnical already but the point I is that these Germans were by certain standards especially in the East complete outsiders and secondly they were Aryans but not Pagans still um, so there was a, a an ensemble of factors that brought to say okay let's get, get rid of these because they are um, taking too much uh, you know they're, they're taking too much in, in here in terms of uh, we have to get rid of them so this brought uh, in a certain sense to bring um, the major cultural um, um, you know the this brought essentially to an Hellenization of language uh, of excuse me of, of, of um, language and culture into the East, so that um, many people confuse this as in nationalistic terms. At the time, it was nothing like a nation in the Hellenic sense of the world. I mean, um, being a, an Hellene, being a Greek, was a matter of of mind more than you know what you looked like. And also, especially during the Hellenistic times, this concept of being a Greek was definitely softening up in terms of strict, you know. Um, identity origin. This is something that started since the. Uh, maybe we'll say, well, it began, in fact, with, with the Hellenism, with Alexander, with this expansion of the Greek world into the East and their, uh, the syncrasis with the local places. This was telling the truth partly existing also in classical times, but definitely at this time in the late antique, being Greek was a matter of es essentially of culture and of language. It wasn't just. And and naturally Greek was the most spoken language, it was the uh, culture that had produced more um, more works, more, uh, you know, th that had reached actually the, the apex, of the uh, at least the Mediterranean uh, intellectual development, and uh, as we were saying before, the same Romans got kind of Hellenized, especially the elites uh, studied Greek, and they, wa they went studying Greece, and it was a, a um, the the Hellenic culture really permeated the whole empire in many ways, and and naturally the agency in this area of the eastern the eastern empire was really dominated by 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 Greek as as a language. By the way, um, was like a bit English today, um, so it it wasn't really a matter of saying okay, um, you come from it as long as you you knew and this uh, you knew greek and you know uh, in fact the if you look at the byzantine bureaucracy that is being formed this time you realize that as we were saying before all the subjects of the empire at this point had become roman citizens so everybody could access practically and this bureaucracy was based uh, not just on the studying of administration and all but also on the education into the uh, hellenic classics like you, you had to study the Iliad, uh, the Odyssey, you had to stu study Hellenic poetry. I mean, this was a... The, the Byzantines were starting to build their state revolving around these three concepts. Christian religion, Roman state, um, 
or better Roman yeah say Roman state which entails by the way Roman law and Roman army never to forget and Hellenic culture that is Hellenic education if you want so this idea of the Hellenic identity taking o taking over into the east also it, it was something kind of obvious because those were already Hellenic lands essentially uh, at, at least in language and it was unavoidable and although Latin actually remained for 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 some centuries actually still th the language of uh, especially of the army but also of of law and uh, administration is by a certain extent um, it's kind of obvious that these eastern lands were mostly um, getting Hellenized in tongue and especially this is all the more evident um, with the Arab invasions were basically the the also these um, Semitic and uh, Kamitic areas like uh, Syria, Palestine and Egypt get lost and therefore the empire shrinks once again closer to the core of the Hellenic uh, speaking lands and that's why it kind of got Hellenized and this is why in the West they said okay these were these are not really Romans these are Greeks like in, in, in the West we're saying it uh, with a contempt or with a derogatory term because they were essentially kidding on the fact that these that the Roman Empire considered itself Roman while these were not Romans but Greeks and, and, and here there is all the, <laughs> the great uh, enmity especially this was uh, a, a propaganda pushed mostly by the uh, Germanic um, Empire that naturally wanted to uh, be equated to the Byzantine Empire as, uh, as a fully Roman Empire while they perfectly knew that by by law they weren't because uh, uh, by law only an emperor by Roman law only an emperor can appoint another emperor this thing of that had happened with Charlemagne and Papacy year year 800 was completely abnormal uh, although in here other factors came into play because the Germans at this point and um, the they had started doing it immediately as as soon as had as they had begun to settle into the Roman lands. They they started thinking that there was a divine sanction of their power. This was a, a, a concept that was actually mixed a bit um, that blended in both the Christian and the pagan concept of of rule, mm -hmm. because uh, both. Um, you know, Christianity basically says, on the wake of the uh, Judaic, uh, the Jewish um, um, tradition, that you have to essentially be careful of the rulers, whoever they are, because they have a kind of divine mandate by some some reasons. I mean, or better, obviously a pagan doesn't have a, a divine mandate, but um, the he's still there because of because God wanted it mm. so you have to take care of that and, and still be respectful and this is by the way how the Jews had sort of managed to survive and to expand so much into the uh, to the same Roman Empire and, and previously into the Hellenistic world because they were quite respecters usually at least of their own as long as uh, their temple wasn't touched their their, their holy places weren't uh, profan profaned they they kind of were good subjects. Mm. Uh, you find Jews in Rome to be witness already from since the second century BC. They, uh, it's only with Christianity essentially the problems start occurring um, as Christianity was a Jewish sect in practice that also brought agitation within the same Jewish community. Um, and, and from the pagan side it was this idea that the divine glory was inherent in into those who won with arms so the Germans said okay we don't care if you are by right by Roman right uh, something like you know uh, the, the truth is we we conquered your lands and we rule over them so it's because uh, the, mm, the deity whichever it is wanted it and this is very strong because if you look at the origin actually of the Roman 
imperium of the Roman Empire proper, there is not this legalism and uh, that the Byzantines eventually stressed to say, okay, we are the... There was essentially this same concept of uh, pagan glory that was conceived by the Romans exactly in the same way, for which the Roman law was just an approximation, by the way, that naturally developed into the extremely important Roman law, um, because the Roman society was extremely complex, so the Romans had needed to, to get it regulated. Um, but the I in origin, the objectively the same Roman Empire was born from this Aryan concept that indeed the 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 power is belongs to to whom to who conquers and that's the reason why the Romans chose the Roman eagle as their symbol uh, and why they they thought to be an elected people just like the Jews thought they were to be an elected people because of divine sanction even in very even different very different ways but uh, the Germans, in this sense, were partly right, and the Byzantines instead always stressed, okay, we have to go by the book, we have to go by the rule. Um, you are not being appointed emperor by a true Roman emperor, so you're not, you can't be emperor, and that's why the Byzantines practically never recognized the... Uh, they, they recognized the Pope at a certain point, very late in time, as the leader of the, ch of the Christian Church, they even accepted becoming Catholic at the very end, because they were desperate to get... Um, aids from the uh, to, to counter the Ottomans and this was just a diplomatic thing for which the the Emperor said okay we will do it to the Pope but obviously the, the rest of the Byzantine population absolutely didn't want to know anything about it and it seems that this also pr uh, accelerated the same Ottoman advance because the Orthodox um, uh, community preferred paradoxically to be under the Muslims than under the uh, the Catholics Anyway, they they were you know the, the Catholics could have never saved Constantinople at that point from from the Ottoman advance, unfortunately. But let's say unfortunately for the Byzantines, but um, uh, and eventually also for the Westerners because they they found the Ottoman army uh, at at the gates of, of Vienna. But the 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 concept is, however, that. Um, the Byzantines really s uh, took extremely seriously their imperial prerogative, also on the base, and especially on the base of not just divine sanction, but also by legal order. And it's actually the same thing because, um, and this is the point, uh, it was the Emperor Theodosius II who ruled actually for a very long time, between 408 and 450, that collected in a unique uh, uh, l uh, code of law known as the Codex Theodosianus emanated in 438. The laws that had been promulgated by the Christian emperors mm, as a point of reference for a new uh, jurisprudence. So this was very important because um, it was not just a Roman law now that naturally um, emerged also from the pagan, quite recent pagan past, I'm not sure. But it was also, um, I mean, that the the um, the Christian, uh, the same Christian emperors had used. But also, this was a divine sanction in, in a certain sense of a new law, mm. so of a system that wasn't just conceived as a set of rules, very secularly or plainly from from a modern point of view. But it was conceived as a description of a regulation of the whole universe. Given that the empire was a univer what con was conceived as a uh, de universal empire, that had to regulate the life of all the Roman subjects and slash Christians, because that was one thing with all of them. So theoretically, wherever there was a Christian, that was conceived by the Romans as a Roman subject or as a potential Roman subject, because that's the nature of the Ecumenic Empire. And this concept of the universalism is gonna leave basically until till very late in time it was in to con the contemporary era and um, so never think of the, at, at, at the Roman Empire as a secular world it's not that the conversion to Christianity brought to a new view seeing religion no it was the same exact thing even in pagan empire was uh, uh, was not not a secular empire. Never mistake the Roman Empire for a 19th century um, 
uh, nation state because it was not the case and religion had always been at the center uh, of the Roman Empire as for the same nature of what empire actually means as we said before relatively to the Aryan glory and all this stuff so now skip to the to the Theodosian Codex but it was still uh, however making a point um, that is however the Byzantines managed to reshape their own state actually in, in even a more functional way than what was happening in in uh, that it was before mm. and this is something that started arguably with Diocletian's and Constantine um, Con and Constantine's reforms um, the West also had a functioning state but the problem there was mostly a matter of resources you can argue that the Roman models were not effectively so diverse it's just the Byzantines gave to their own system a, a greater centralized character um, they they built around it this concept of quite strong ideological concept of being you know uh, also permeated by a certain idea of the world of a certain culture there was um, um, there was also a much greater social mobility so at, at this time the, the Byzantines were fully on the wake of Roman pragmatism as well and it's really important for you have to think of really at the occasion that it con the the Constantine took, you know, by founding Constantinople. I mean, the idea of building another not another empire, but another administration from scratch, especially far away from the Romans' uh, senatorial class, it was this extremely influent aristocracy that always you had always to confront it. No, say what I, I shift everything to the east and built my I built my own uh, capital in in here, and I make it something that goes by my rules. So in a very original way that uh, eventually won as a model, as the west fell and 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 the east didn't. Um, However, we were hinting at the enormous problems that the, uh, the Eastern uh, Roman Empire had in these uh, centuries as well. Um, we have talked about turbulent steps that were just close to, to Bosphorus. Um, the, the Byzantines at this time were extremely, uh, they were usu usually playing with diplomacy, that it means to uh, pay tributes to these populations. Paying tributes is not something you do when you are a subject, because um, Bribery is another term, but if you look at at a strict diplomatical point of view, basically every single um, power at the time paid tributes to someone to do what he wanted. Mm. And it was much um, cheaper than fighting. At this time, as we were saying also, uh, the manpower was an extremely precious resource. You can argue that the Eastern Roman Empire kind of made it, and the Western Roman Empire didn't, also because in the East there were many more resources than in the West at this point. So it's not even necessarily the, the, the Byzantine formula that kind of made it, that objectively pro really helped, in, in my opinion. But it was also a matter of available manpower. You know, that this problem, the, 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 the country is depopulated, the the problem, uh, the the food for the army is a huge problem. You have always to think of the um, ex the major expense of the empire to be military, mm. and there were huge expenses. You couldn't, you know, wage war con continuously. It would have exhausted the economy. It would have been a, a huge problem. There were a lot of monetary policies at this point. It's very complicated. But let's just put it in this way: that a very good way to divert the enemy. The penetration of of, um, um, of the peoples dwelling into the barbaricum was to um, redirect, uh, redirect someone. Um, um, excuse me, to to uh, how do you say? To redirect, yes, to d deflect them in some way. 
towards the west. Now this was something not very nice, <laughs> given that yeah, theoretically these were uh, just um, you know in, in the empire, uh, the empire was still one, even though it was split administratively between west and east. But it's not that these two halves really liked much each other. They also came to to conflict at a certain point. That ho however was something very contingent was reduced. Actually, they they acted in tandem, but if the emperors in of Constantinople were to suffer an invasion from a people that could be sent somewhere else, they obviously preferred to do that. So, actually, the West um, partly suffered, was burdened also by these um, by the populations that were redirected redirected uh, from the East to the West. However. Another very massive problem of the East was the eastern border, mm. and especially it is extremely uh, because of the presence of Sassanid Persia. Naturally, there was this major power at this time that had grown, um, especially from the third century, as um, an extremely insidious um, military machine that uh, the Parthians had not been. The Sassanids were way more advanced. Um, they were very aggressive. They never never gave up the idea they had to to win over the Near East from the Romans. Um, and that had definitely the, and, and they were also very difficult to crash because it, it was practically impossible to invade Persia at this time and and hope to eradicate every single citadel, every single um, the fortress. Um, the problem with Persia was really something that arguably never finished. Yeah, at the end the Romans won, but already other times the Romans had crushed uh, um, had crushed uh, Persia as a power. But this kind of re uh, reemerged in in a way or in another. Uh, you could fragment this empire, the, the Persian Empire, but you couldn't really eradicate this, the, the local uh, uh, you know, the local lordships from this immense uh, ir Iranian plateau that was, uh, by the way, a, an extremely tough ground, also militarily speaking, and therefore this, and if, if the Arabs had not come, uh, probably the Persia would have kind of Reemerged, and it definitely reemerged even in under the Muslim domination. Persia always remained this kind of polar um, area from which great empires eventually were rebuilt once again and again and again. So it was kind of this never-ending problem of of the Persians, and and um, also in here the, the eastern the eastern frontier absorbed uh, a freaking lot of resources. Uh, there were moments, uh, naturally, of peace. For instance, 422, it was this um, long peace that was uh, signed, and uh, um, and and that allowed also, from this point of view, especially during during the remaining fifth century, to the the Byzantines to effectively um, rethink and to consolidate the organization of the state. And also to deal with the major problems that were uh, agitating uh, the internal uh, the internal situation. This is important because let's assume the Persians had uh, not accepted uh, the the peace. Well, maybe uh, the Byzantines would have not been able to strengthen themselves enough during the fifth century, might have fallen in another context. So history could have taken radically another path, and these were. Uh, these are all factors you have to take into consideration when you study, you know, you're saying, yeah, this power had to make it because it was so good, so strong. Yeah, okay, it was so good, so strong, but if you look at all everything that could really happen that didn't depend on the strength of the empire, you realize that this empire could have still been curbed or at least reduced um, in its power. Maybe it would have succumbed to other because you don't have to think of this as isolated systems, as if, you know, you, you get weaker, yeah, so it's just about you, and maybe someone else will come, 
at one time to to crush you because as long as you come you become weak there's always someone out there that is going to take advantage of that and then you can be easily wiped out so it's it, i find very fascinating also from a strictly strategical point of view how these powers manage always to keep the balance in way or another and therefore when you look at the um the strict development of um of these empires and their political measures and economical measures you know sitting on a chair in the 21st century say oh yeah here they got it wrong because they should have done that and yeah the empire would have gone better off because i know better no you don't know better you wouldn't absolutely know how to manage uh the pizza and tea empire <laughs> better than than what those guys did and this obviously doesn't mean that they never made mistakes but especially when you find these long-term policies uh reforms uh, you have always to understand them in a you know, because there were uh, these were things that partially were already f partially reversible. Telling the truth, I mean, they were part; they were just the sanction of a process that had already occurred in practice, and to which the the, the state had to adopt in a certain way. And even other policies have to be understood very often because of this contingental reason that so that that there was not much of a choice most of the times uh, you know, the, the times into which um, an empire could simply take breath and say whew well we made it so now finally we have some spare time and it's, it's pretty rare you know it's pr really really rare Espe especially in this very moment in in history where the 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 international scenario was extremely tormented and you couldn't even practically plan to to you know to know what would happen because it wasn't possible it was everything so dynamic just think about the hunts and how they changed radically the world uh the world situation uh even in you know the the domino effect was caused uh that caused to to move all these Germanic peoples into the empire. I mean, really things could change unexpectedly in a very short time, and it's not something you could foresee. But especially it's most of the times, but especially it was not something you could have the chance to halt. So never be harsh when judging these um, these empires, especially at this time where we know so very few about the world. Um, you know how the story actually went because we have a very few sources so wh what do you even criticize if you don't even we don't even know what actually happened we lack macroscopical evidence of social indicator socio-economical indicators and how can we judge we have just to speculate in some measure so what do you criticize them for just straight just try to understand it first um, so uh, towards the end of the fifth century um the the Byzantines pushed uh especially the Ostrogoths um towards Italy. The Ostrogoths had been, been um you know the Visigoths had been integrated in the previous centuries into the Empire and it would once they were arguably already more Romanized and uh, they were they had been dwelling closer to the Roman border to for, for a longer time and were sent now to it had been sent to Italy to actually yeah Alaric especially made a bit of a mess both in Greece and in Italy and uh, it sacked Rome famously even though it wasn't such an excessively dramatic thing as as we we could think even though it, it had a huge echo during the time and they settled into Spain now the Ostrogoths were the guys who um, were kind of some of the more in, in opposition to the Roman world in many ways. They were, they were more barbaric in culture. They had remained more time under the Huns. I mean, the Visigoths, I mean, think about the Battle of the Catalanian Fields. Um, from the Roman side, you find the Visigoths. From the Hunnic side, you find the Ostrogoths. The, Go the Ostrogoths had been dwelling to the Ukrainian steppes at that point, or had come closer to the Roman Empire when basically the the Hunnic Empire had dissolved and they had always maintained a pretty important role even under the Hunnic Empire Attila kind of um, estimated the Ostrogoths pretty much they, they had become m even more than Visigoths um, an equestrian people mm. they some of the best 
knight, Germanic cavalry of the migration era definitely came from, from the Ostrogoths. So at this time, what they, they kind of um, lose their Hunnic masters, they, the, the Ostrogoths go towards Dacia, towards the Danube, and they settle in there. So the Byzantines were fed up with these because they were this looming threat to the to the frontier and they decide to send them to Italy. So the Emperor Zeno tell, told the Ostrogoths, look, to Theoderic was the king of the Ostrogoths, um, go to Italy on my behalf. That, imi- that means reconquer Italy for, for Constantinople. So naturally the Ostrogoths um, were a bit freer than that and ta- seized this opportunity however because they Italy was uh, still a very still intact in terms of uh, of uh, of state of economy of society and uh, they were backed by uh, the Ostrogoths now were even backed by the, the same Roman emperors okay they go into Italy famously they crush and kill uh, Odoacher and they create their own kingdom into into Italy I'm sure if you uh, search into my uh, channel, you will find several things about the uh, the Ostrogoths. Uh, I made, I think, a pair, two or three videos about them. It can be, if you're interested about them, you can check that out. Um, so this was a, actually a great move for Constantinople. So you see all things, you know, step by step that were exploited by the Byzantines to set things right. Diverting peoples, settling diplomatic relations, strengthening internal administration, um, looking at the new opportunities that were arising and and this thing. And, and uh, when the Ostrogoths left, uh, for instance the Byzantines took the chance to solve um, a very old problem that was the one of these Aurian people, that was the um, population um, dwelling into the the Asia Minor's uh, mountainous region of the Taurus Mountains. These were um, the Taurus Mountains was o- of great importance also strategically speaking because it basically connected um, Asia Minor to Syria. Um, Asia Minor had been always um, Asia Minor very is very diverse in terms of climate and um, in terrain, etc. In these southern, southeastern regions, had always been populated by um, pretty warlike, mountainous peoples that were very tough to to control. I mean, the empire had always been like this, um, and it's not that you know wherever it was the empire, every population was subjugated. Really, uh, there were certain communities that kind of lived on on their own a little bit and when things got uh, you know when, when there was an adjective f- I mean for centuries these populations had remained substantially um, uh, obedient then when the cr- all these crises of the uh, of the empire had kind of emerged then they took the chance to rebel it's so like a bit the Bagaudi in, in the West in Gaul for instance, uh, like these populations that had never been fully Romanized, that had not been interested into that. It's not a matter of geographical distance. Never think it is like that. They, um, there could be extremely wide populations, also relatively pretty close to the main centers, the main cities of the empire. The Isaurians in here are the, the example of it. It was just a matter of Romanization. The, the Romans had cared only about um, the trade, to go without problems, of cities to function, uh, of brigandage and piercy to, to be the belt, that was it. They didn't care about going to Romanize into uh, populations that were superficially Romanized but that didn't create problems. So these Aurians were pretty warlike, um, had remained in to these mountains making you know causing pretty serious problems uh, all around. Um, the um, so they they were f- eventually used in anti-Germanic function by the Byzantines and um, and actually the same Emperor Zeno that ruled between 474 and 491 came uh, was um, Zeno is a Greek name but he actually was Isaurian himself 
and this had not stopped actually the um, these audience from being turbulent at all also because there were dif different dynamics involved and it was the successor of, of Zeno um, Anastasius the first that ruled between 491 and 518 in uh, 498 to get rid of this population by carrying out essentially a massive deportation of these Aurians. So this was a pretty effective mean to do that. You know, this idea of deporting populations was normal um, because when we hear the term deportation we immediately think about things like, I don't know, genocide and stuff like that. But actually if you look at human history, deportations obviously caused genocide. It, it happened. Obviously genocide implies an intention and all, but it was normal throughout all history to deport populations to eradicate them uh, eradicate, I mean relocating them from their original um, uh, territory and to scatter them possibly or to uh, however settle them in places that were easily controllable that uh, didn't have where there were fortresses and there were places that maybe were had gone depopulated so then the administration the state wanted them to 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 work the land in there and the Romans had always been doing that since uh, if you think about I don't know, the Ligurians back in the day were deported into the Somnium or uh, there were many things like this and deportation was quite useful because in this sense it was not meant to kill the population but to relocate it to 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 make it work in more into areas that as we're, we, we just said could be could turn profitable and, and in this time at the end of the fifth century um, as we sa we have said, also the uh, human resources were extremely important. You don't get rid of of people, eliminating them physically. Mm -hmm. uh, at the height of the empire, where the population was uh, even excessive, and there were other populations that came, and uh, you could easily slaughter an entire people. At this point, even a some thousands of tens of thousands population was an extremely precious precious resource that you wouldn't um, uh, you wouldn't waste by just killing it. It would have been stupid. And so the problem of these audience was deported. By the way there, there was a a follower of mine that I want to thank him for always um, you know being interested in my topic. He asked me well why don't you make a video about on these audience more in detail. Sure, I will. I promise I will uh, if I'll have uh, the chance. And uh, I was able, I was happy today just to hint at it, just to give also other people, if I've never heard about this population, to you know, to be aware that it at least it existed and, and read about it. Because, by the way, I don't know excessively much about it myself. So, um, so, as we've seen, there were also some certain ethnical problems, because, for instance, these Isaurians had, I don't know how ethnical the problem had been, but they, they kind of felt a peop like a people within this empire that was rebellious to, to the central rule in some measure. So, this is how really the concept of the, not of the empire as a, ge as a geographical thing, but as, as a set of peoples was, was really the, is really the realistic depiction of the ancient world. Um, and there were surely also other populations that were of difficult control into the empire. However, another big chapter of the uh, problems that affected the empire this time was of um, religious nature. Um, and this is kind of the um, a thorn <laughs> In the flag of uh, of the Byzantines for for much of their of this uh, time and also in, in in the following times, arguably up to the uh, up to the Arab uh, advance. The Arab invasion. Sorry. So this one is essentially the problem of the religious um, clashes that invested, especially the. Uh, uh, eastern and southern provinces of the 
Eastern Roman Empire. Um, so back in the day, the, the main problem was the Trinitary uh, question, had been at least at the beginning of the fourth century, and that's also where Constantine had uh, intervened, essentially by favoring, starting favoring the Christi uh, the Christians and allowing uh, them officially on the wake of what his predecessors had already started uh, the freedom of uh, of cult mm -hmm. um, at this time that had with the council with the dog with the affirmation of the dogma at Nicaea in 225 um, the um, the uh, Trinitary matter had been uh, settled definitely um, now the main problem was instead the relation between the uh, divine and nature uh, ex excuse me the divine and uh, human nature of of Christ so at the council of chalcedon in 451 chalcedon is a suburb of of constantinople uh, um it's in today's turkey in fact and um in egypt and syria um the 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 majority of the population had not accepted um, the uh, the Alphazite, uh doctrine that had been uh, uh, essentially mm, uh, affirmed during at Council uh, in 451. And uh, the the leader in this opposition was actually the theological school of uh, Alexandria. Um, that opposed, in fact, the uh, Diophysite uh, doctrine. The Diophysite doctrine is basically, uh, quite simply, the 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 idea that um, in the um, in the person of the Son of Christ um, uh, exist two natures at the same time, um, and it was uh, actually. Uh, I don't know how to say that monophysitism. <laughs> Wait a second, because in English, everything would be easier <laughs> if I spoke my own tongue. Uh, but however, the monophysite doctrine uh, had this uh, this greater fortune, and the, the monophysitism. Let's let me see. Yeah, this is the the substantive monophysitism. Um, had um, it said tended essentially to interpret this dogma by attributing to the Christ the uh, a prevalently divine nature. Um, so this um, this this was very important for the empire because naturally Egypt was and the. I mean, Egypt, Syria, and Palestine were some of the most, uh, some of the wealthiest, and rich, uh, and richest, and more productive uh, provinces of the empire. But nevertheless, they were far from Constantinople. Uh, at this point, the um, because of the political, the international political instability, the it's as if the the range um, and the deterrent effect of Constantinople had had shrunk. Uh, also geographically speaking. So these were regions that were not just backing these doctrines for sheer theological problems. So it was actually a political stand because these regions were hoping to get rid of of um, the uh, of Constantinople's taxes and to dwell on their own, especially these major uh, these pa the, the metropolis, the, the patriarchs of Alexandria, of Jerusalem, of Antioch were gaining you know, a lot of power, just like in the in the West, the bishops were becoming de facto the the most important figures in the local administration of, of the cities, especially in, in especially in the East, the uh, the uh, the cities were a bit like the cornerstone of the Roman domination. These were huge metropolis, actually, um, and. It's, it was evident that uh, 
going against Constantinople also from a religious point of view was a way of saying okay we we don't really want you to interfere with our with our business in in the first place this created lots of problems because naturally Constantinople needed especially the the grain uh, the wheat coming from from uh, Egypt and and that's how Constantinople w uh, the people of Constantinople w w were fed just like in Italy they were fed with the uh, grain of uh, of Africa and, and Sicily in Constantinople it was mostly about uh, Egypt and Syria so uh, the, uh, the the real problem was uh, that uh, not at all times the the Byzantines could intervene in there and also intervene in it with uh, with the iron fist would have created more uh, uh, more problems than uh, uh, um, more discontent and you know why would even in strictly political terms uh, a Christian emperor uh, use the sword against its own Christian subjects and naturally the the uh, the different religious interpretations were pretty serious matters but breaking the unity of the empire was something quite risky so there was a lot of even of, of negotiation in part this problem of monophysitism however was more important uh, what well, was the more important considering that at the time the um, the church of Alexandria was uh, carrying out um, a an evangelization of the populations uh, living in the Upper Nile uh, Valley and in Abyssinia. So these were regions that in fact still um, have a uh, in their Coptic church the, the le this doctrinal legacy of monophysitism that dates back to the time. So the, the problem was that this um, different uh, doctrinal interpretation was expanding also into lands that substantially um, into which this uh, this heterodox, heterodox thinking could, could expand and therefore gain steam um, so at this point we, we said the, the the emperors of Constantinople couldn't really intervene directly because it, it was simply out of their reach uh, in practice so they started doing something especially in the second half from the second half of the fifth century to do pretty uh, debatable f uh, debatable things in orthodox terms that is basically to um, say um, mild and um, uh, and to soften up the uh, decisions that had been taken in uh, at Chalcedon uh, and therefore starting to um, um, to even become indulgent and to support uh, the uh, the same monophysite uh, creed mm -hmm. um, so the uh, if you look at the broader outcome of this is the emperors didn't really make it to solve the problems with Syria and Egypt mm. uh, on the contrary were quite quite evenly on the path of trying to to autonomize themselves from from the central government of Constantinople and but they also produced problems within the same Constantinople so that there were different political part uh, sides now that were saying okay but why is our emperor taking side in favor of the monophysites while we all know <laughs> that that's a misinterpretation from an orthodox point of view and also another problem was caused with the west mm, because the pope from rome that in, in the meanwhile <laughs> was uh, under the ostrogoths and uh, you know, in, uh, enjoying this kind of strange situation, and it was also more, more, more than pope. That was naturally the moral figure, but in the West, there was still the Roman aristocracy, the uh, Italic uh, Romano-Italic aristocracy that was pretty much, as we've seen, uh, 
was pretty uh, proud and uh, about its own prerogatives and they obviously didn't like very much uh, also they didn't like the Ostrogoths much but they also didn't like the Byzantines much at this point uh, and, and it is f uh, therefore it is um, this religious conduct um, of Constantinople um, eventually was destined to fail because nobody at that point could pretend even to, to, to uh, reverse the uh, conclusions that had had been uh, reached uh, in a in an ecumenic council like the one at Chalcedon. Mm -hmm. So, in in between uh, in the winter of 443-444, the Emperor Justinian, that we talked about extensively on Schwerpunkt at this point. So, if you're gonna if you're interested about him, just check it out there is you can just enter the key and um, and find with through that the, the name just um, search for Justinian there is the uh, that lens of um, how do you say it in English um, the uh, magnifying glass symbol on the channel so that you can write ins insert the key there press enter and you're gonna have the results so if you're interested about that but relatively to this uh, there was the um, the famous uh, edict of the three chapters mm -hmm. that uh, Justinian himself basically um, pronounced while pressed by the monophysites um, in, into which he did something a bit complicated to say that is uh, he uh, Justinian condemned um, the uh, certain theological texts that uh, had been judged to have this Nestorian uh, imprinting um, and um, that however had not been condemned by the uh, the, cons uh, the, um, the, uh, the Council of Chalcedon so this um, had this is a bit more complicated um, um, to to explain in detail because actually it's it's much more uh, complex than uh, than this and uh, Nestorianism had affirmed the total separations of the two nature of natures of, of of Christ that is the divine and uh, and human one so he basically denied the hypostatic union uh, of of the of uh, uh, you know uh, of the two uh, natures um, so it was all a bit of a tricky thing to do but this produced um, a hi these uh, texts had judged as only had been deemed of having a Nestorian imprinting mm -hmm. so this was seen evidently as a move only to back the monophysites by, by many and especially in the western province of the church there was a sort of uh, uh, massive uh, refusal of, of, of this attitude like what, what the hell are you doing and um, Pope Vigilius that had uh, so the Roman bishop that had op initially opposed to the imperial decisions was arrested. It was brought to Constantinople and he was obliged to bow uh, at this point and to accept the thing. By the way, at this time Italy had been reconquered by the Byzantine souls in here. Um, it's interesting that Constantinople could use an iron fist on the same Church of Rome and to show you know what. However, this. Um, the uh, edict of the three chapters brought to a schism that was called uh, the schism of uh, Aquileia because it had started from from there essentially um, because uh, Aquileia was a metropolitic seat and uh, together with uh, Milan they decided to um, basically um, to um, detach themselves from Constantinople this was a very interesting thing that happened because um, this occurred basically also during the time of the crisis with the Longburn invasion. And by the way, the Longburns were quite clever at exploiting this uh, as well. In, for, uh, by the way, in um, together with um, 
with the Pope that eventually kept basically even after Vigilius the, the Roman popes were at that point opposed to this um, to Constantinople relatively to the three chapters and uh, it's not before the end of the seventh century that this schism basically came to an end. It came to an end simply because by, by that point uh, all those monophysite promises had been lost by, by Constantinople so there was no reason to keep pushing for this quite a heterodox, uh, a heterodox uh, um, religious policy to weaken essentially the uh, the, f uh, the control over the few lands that had remained into the hands of of the Byzantines uh, at that point. So uh, this was a pretty long video. Uh, I would like to add something more, but I think we discussed extensively for today what we wanted to say. Um, I've made several other videos in which I I get a bit more in detail relatively to this topics and we'll keep discussing them <laughs> shortly. Um, so for now I just hope that you enjoyed uh, this video and if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!